Ja, hej, hej. Daniel Forslund kommer alldeles snart och hälsa välkomna här. Jag heter Andreas Hager, jag är moderator. Vilket betyder att jag har kontakt med föreläsare och kommer hjälpa till att lyfta fram lite frågor. Varför jag är här är för att min stora passion i livet är att hjälpa långvarigt sjuka i samhället att få ett bättre liv. Och framförallt också alla som hjälper de långvarigt sjuka. Så jag tycker det är väldigt spännande att få vara del av det här. Daniel? Tack så mycket Andreas. Och välkomna hit allihopa. Ni som lyssnar på webben eller finns här i salen på Vinova. Idag heter Daniel Forslund. Är chefstrateg här på Vinova och ansvarar för våra satsningar kring innovationskraft i offentlig verksamhet. Och det här det första webbseminariet är en serie kring just design i vård och omsorg. är en del av vårt arbete med att förbättra innovationskraften i hela den offentliga sektorn. Det här webbseminarieserien gör vi tillsammans, vi på Vinova tillsammans med Innovationsrådet, med SKL och med SVID, Stiftelsen för svensk industridesign. Vi tycker det här är ett väldigt spännande sätt att erbjuda er på antingen fysiskt att vara här hos oss över en lunch och äta en enkel måltid med oss och lära av varandra. Men också för er som inte kan resa till Stockholm och som vill vara med i det här lärandet online och kunna bidra med era synpunkter och kunskaper. Ni kommer kunna twittra på en tagg som heter Design FBH om du vill följa det som sker på, i, under föreläsningen här. Och vi kommer också ha ett diskussionsforum kopplat till webbsändningen som ni kan följa. Så att vi hoppas för, på en interaktiv och spännande lunchövning här där jag först ska säga några ord om varför vi Vinnova gör det här tillsammans med de här andra tre aktörerna. Och som sagt, innovationskraft i offentlig verksamhet kallar vi det här området. Och det gör vi för att vi från Vinovas sida har sett att vi måste stödja den offentliga sektorn på nya sätt att omsätta alla goda idéer, alla innovativa förslag, alla förbättringsförslag, alla förändringsarbeten som pågår till innovationer får de spridda och använda ute i offentlig verksamhet. Och vår bild i det här, vår roll i det här arbetet är att skapa både tillväxt för olika företag och också skapa samhällsnytta för de offentliga aktörerna. Och det är de två benen vi står på i det här arbetet. Och vi har ju som uppgift i det här området då att verkligen omsätta innovativa idéer till nyttiggjorda produkter, tjänster, nya organisationsformer, nya sätt att arbeta ute i den hela den offentliga sektorn. Eh, varför offentlig sektor undrar ni? Vinnova kanske inte har jobbat så mycket med det tidigare. Det har vi, eh, men mest eh, i små avgränsade projekt i kommuner och landsting. Eh, nu tar vi ett mer systematiskt grepp för att verkligen eh, stödja allt från idéskapande till utprovning av innovationer till upphandling av innovationer och införande av innovationer i hela den offentliga sektorn. Det här är en stor sektor. Vi är över 1,3 miljoner människor som jobbar i den offentliga sektorn. Vi upphandlar för nästan 500 miljarder i offentlig sektor varje år. Det finns en stor potential om vi lyckas få in innovationer i allt från upphandling till utveckling till kravställande i den offentliga sektorn. Och vi vill då åstadkomma en, en beteendeförändring kan man väl säga. En, ett sätt att jobba i offentlig sektor som leder till eh, en förbättring för hela samhället. Och vi har delat in vårt arbete i tre stora områden kan man säga. Eh, dels handlar det om att adressera hinder för utveckling. Alla vill ju ta vara på innovationskraften. Alla vill att vi ska sprida goda projektresultat och se till att vi ständigt förbättrar oss, utmanar våra arbetssätt. Men hur gör vi? Där jobbar vi tillsammans med SKL kring att just inventera och adressera alla de hinder som finns för att gå från ord till handling när det gäller innovationsarbete. Vi kommer att satsa på ledarskapet i den offentliga sektorn, att få modiga, 
förändringsledare på politisk nivå, på chefsnivå, ute i kommuner, landsting, statliga myndigheter som kan ta till sig den här typen av kunskap kring design av både tjänster, processer, kring produkt- och tjänsteinnovation som vågar införa och använda nya spännande lösningar och även premiera anställda som har idéer. Att vi verkligen stadgar upp alla de eldsjälar och alla de idégivare som finns ute i våra verksamheter. Vi ska också stimulera nyttgörandet genom att vi satsar vidare på våra innovationsslussar där vi fångar idéer från personal, från företag lokalt genom att också då etablera ett stort antal testbäddsmiljöer där vi öppnar upp offentliga aktörer för att pröva att innovationer faktiskt fungerar. Att de ger nytta, att de går att tillämpa och införa på ett brett sätt i den offentliga verksamheten. Också skapa incitament för att sprida resultaten, att skapa stimulerande tävlan, att lära av andra länder där exempelvis England är ett lysande exempel där man har olika tävlingar och utmaningar för förändringsarbete och innovationsarbete i vården. Vi ska också bygga ny kunskap, att få in nya aktörer att söka hos Vinnova i samarbete med andra och se till att man kan omsätta sina idéer till en innovation som verkligen ger nytta. Och då handlar det om att verkligen sänka tröskeln, att få små kommuner, kanske få hemtjänstgruppen eller få en skola eller få en annan myndighet att våga starta ett stort och svårt förändringsarbete. Där vi då kan också stödja dem med en ny och enklare insatsform som vi hoppas kunna öppna upp här i mars månad. Vi ska också mäta effekterna av det här. Vi kommer att jobba tillsammans med andra aktörer för att hitta indikatorer som just mäter och sätter siffror på samhällsnyttan vi skapar genom innovation i den offentliga sektorn. Med denna lilla korta introduktion så hoppas jag att ni har lite bakgrund till varför vi finns här. Um, and I will now switch over to English so that also Helen can follow me. Um, and um, the theme for, for this uh, first lecture today is uh, design of, of services in uh, UK healthcare and um, for um, inspiring us in different ways of thinking and different ways of finding solutions for this area. We have Helen Baxter from the NHS Institute for Innovation and Improvement. Uh, she's responsible for the uh, experience-based design work within the Institute. And I was um, actually had the pleasure and privilege to, to visit the Institute and Helen uh, last fall, uh, together with some colleagues from the County Council here in Sweden. So we had a lot of learning experiences that I'm now excited to hear more about and I also share with all of you. So uh, having that said, I'm heading over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, good. Well, it's still good morning here. I think it's good afternoon with you um, in Sweden, but um, I'm delighted to be able to do this and hope that you can hear me um, well um, on this um, web conference. Um, as Daniel said, I'm Helen Baxter. I work at the NHS Institute for Innovation and Improvement, um, and I work in the innovation and design team. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our innovation process um, within the NHS Institute um, that we use to develop products which support the NHS. And I will give you some examples um, of some of the work that we've done um, within healthcare. So I thought, um, first of all, I would just um, tell you a little bit about the NHS Institute. So the NHS Institute is an organization that was established in 2005. Um, and our role is to support the NHS um, in transforming healthcare for patients and the public. Um, and the idea is to be able to spread new ways of working. And um, we have a technology um, part to that as well. Um, but the area that I work in um, is much more in, involved in the service design um, aspect. So the NHS. The NHS um, is the largest employer within um, the UK and is one of the largest employers in the world. Um, we have, um, in 2011-12, we had £106 billion total spend. Um, we see 3 million patients each week um, and there are 1.4 million um, employees within the NHS. So really, you know, to undertake the transformation that we need, to make savings that we need to make to be able to continue to deliver healthcare for all, and um, we have to see transformation. Quite often when we're talking um, 
to staff working on the front line um, and and patients as well is that you know this is a little bit how it feels um, in in the NHS so this is AA Milne and from Winnie the Pooh um, here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now bump 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 on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin it is as far as he knows the only way of coming downstairs but sometimes he feels that there really is another way if only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it and we know you know that's um, you know it's a, a children's writing but actually it's really it's really relevant for how a lot of people feel in terms of delivering health care because they're just trying to get the job done um, and actually sometimes you know that space that thinking time is really important and being able to have that um, is really um, essential to make the differences you know to really do things differently to um, do different things to be able to create that step change performance <clears throat> so our um, team in the NHS Institute, the innovation and design team, we are at the front end really of, of the process within the organisation in terms of um, designing products to support the NHS and, and support the NHS in using the design methodology within um, their own programmes. So we um, test, develop and support specific approaches. So some of you may have heard of um, the Thinking Differently Guide. Um, we've already, um, Daniel mentioned the experience-based design and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as a process. Um, also, we've done some work on culture for innovation. So what are the key dimensions um, that are needed for a culture for innovation to flourish? And also, we in our team, we run innovation cycles, so we explore potential work areas for the NHS Institute. Um, and so we've recently been, um, we're looking at um, a safer nursing care tool, which was um, about um, ensuring that we have safe staffing on, on the wards. So one of the things was actually, do we need to take this forward? We have a web application that we use um, within our, um, on our website. And actually as a result of doing that innovation cycle and understanding what was already out there and whether it was the right thing for people, we've actually withdrawn that. and We've got something else in place to support um, organizations. So, you know, it isn't always about doing things and just taking them forward because somebody thinks it's a good idea. We actually have a process to see whether things should continue um, in, in the NHS. So what is our, our approach? So our innovation approach is um, very much based on design thinking. So our, um, one of our directors, Lynn Ma, who you may have um, heard of, she, um, when we first established ourselves, um, she was sort of went on a study tour and was thinking, you know, we're, in, we're an institute of innovation and improvement. So quite often in the NHS, a lot of work had been done on improvement, but this idea of innovation, what does it mean? other than product innovation. So she went round to um, lots of um, organisations to see successful innovative organisations and see what it was that they utilised. And through that, building on that evidence, it was it was clear that the design approach was the, was the way that um, would work for our organisation. And so it's very much based on user-centred design work, um, service design, and um, we worked closely with, um, very, during our years, we've worked very, with various service design agencies um, and um, it's key about co-production so all of our products that we've developed for the NHS to help them transform their services have been designed with them so it's we've really worked closely with them in terms of understanding what's happening for them currently and actually and and whether the product will support them in their workplaces so the co-production has been really important um, and also this idea of divergent and convergent thinking, because traditionally, you know, within the NHS, and I, this may, may well be true for you as well, is that somebody gets an idea and they just jump to the first solution. So the idea of actually understanding a problem, widely understanding the problem and then converging to identify what the actual issue is rather than what somebody thinks it might be, um, is really key to our innovation approach. And then I think one of the biggest learning for many of us is the, the idea of prototyping and testing to learn. So within traditional healthcare improvement science, there's often this approach of doing rapid, rapid testing. Um, but what we've done within our programs is ensure that that, pro that builds in prototypes rather than just, just testing with the next 10 patients. Let's really understand that interaction 
with the service. Let's understand um, the interaction for the users, both delivering the services and receiving the services. So they're the, the key elements to um, our innovation approach. So in essence, the, the biggest learning that Lynn had when she was doing her, um, her study tour was really that innovation is, is the result of a structured process. And, and so we have, as I say, mentioned before, we have various um, products to support the NHS um, in being more innovative, in particular in looking at how we deliver services. And the Thinking Differently guide um, is really um, quite clear about that and talks about stop before you start, before you start to understand then what the actual challenge is and then move on to building the ideas following on from that. So knowing what your problem is, um, is really important to start with. And, um, and Albert Einstein um, famously said, if I had an hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute finding solutions. Because there's always somebody who's got lots of solutions. You know, lots of us think we know the solution, but actually often what we don't really know is what the problem is. We don't define the challenge. We don't define the issue. So with all of our work, with the um, whether it's experience-based design, thinking differently, most of our um, our work is really about understanding what the challenge is, identifying what the problem is, to then be able to build, um, develop, ide get ideas and, and build them. This is um, just one example um, of some of that thinking differently. And one of the things that we talk about when we're thinking differently is sometimes look at alternative industry, find out what other people are doing, see what, what else there is going on out there. And this is um, in Virginia Mason in, in the States, in the United States. And they have a drive-through flu clinic. So you can get your flu vaccinations. You literally drive through and you, you, know, you have your jab. Um, as you go through. So that's, you know, something that's based on the McDonald's drive through idea, you know, and it's sort of an often when we talk about those sorts of things, you know, we'll have rooms of people and they'll laugh and joke and think, oh, that's that's silly. It couldn't possibly happen. But actually it does happen. Um, and, you know, and we know that within the UK now there are lots of supermarkets who do immunizations and it's a bit, you know, it's that's thinking differently rather than it have to be in um, a doctor's surgery. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, one of the things is that, you know, that thinking differently, that thinking outside of the box often does lead to laughter and, and you know, and building those creative connections. And it's that it is that fun and creative side, actually, that helps to build solutions like um, the, the drive through um, flu clinic. As I mentioned earlier, I, I just want to do a little bit of an introduction to um, experience based design because that's very much based on design thinking. Um, Experience-based design has, we first did our work um, in 2006, we did a, a year-long project with um, an organisation. We asked um, a, a friendly chief executive of, a, of an acute um, trust provider, hospital provider, and said, you know, we want to, we think we should have a go at this, you know, we're doing, we're using this approach for developing our products with the NHS, but actually, what would it be like if we worked with patients and families and staff to understand their experiences using the user-centered design approach? What would that be like? Um, and this, um, and so, you know, would we, are there any of your services that you might um, let us work with? And, um, and this chief executive said, came back to us and said, yes, you know, this organization, we have our head and neck cancer unit who um, are really, um, they achieve all their quality markers. They, they already do some work with patients and trying to end building patient experience and understanding that. So they're probably a good place to start. Um, and so we did a year long project working with service designers um, with the service improvement team in the organization, with the staff, with patients and families, and, and with ourselves um, and the, um, the team from the NHS Institute. And, and what, we, what we did was we worked with, um, with those, those organizations to develop an, an approach. And based on that, um, the academics have written a, a book about, um, use, about um, experience-based design and then and our, our products that some of you will have seen. So what is experience-based design? As I mentioned, it's based on um, design thinking. And it's one of the things that we've struggled a bit with is because it's got the word experience in it, people think it ticks the box in terms of the experience, um, the satisfaction questionnaire almost. And so what we've had to try and um, re 
educate a lot of people about is that this is actually about using those experiences to make a difference. So it's not just about gathering experiences and then, and that's okay, we know what people are experiencing. It's actually about how do we gather that experience? How do we then develop the insights for, from which we can then identify um, the opportunities for improvement? So it's very much about an improvement methodology. It's about ensuring that we make change as a result of understanding the patient's experience, the families and carers experience and the staff experience because understanding what it's like to deliver the service is as important as it is for those who are receiving the service. So um, experience-based design as I mentioned is very much based on the design um, on good design principles so the components of good design are about ensuring that you know the job whatever it is that we're designing does its job so it doesn't matter whether that's a product or a service but actually does it functionally do the job the next element is very much about safety you know and over the past few years we, there's been a lot of work done on functionality and safety within the NHS you know there's a lot of safer care programs we've done a lot of work on a lot of organizations have used lean approach and Toyota production systems and various different things to ensure that they get the processes right but the bit that they often miss and that EBD allows us to really think about is actually that usability so actually what's the interaction with that service so actually how does that feel and how is it experienced and so experience-based design allows us to do that the first um, so we've had various um, projects we've done all sorts of um, experience-based design projects across lots of different um, organizations so whether they've been um, acute trust hospital providers whether they're mental health organizations community providers so where health is provided in the community and so we've done lots we've worked across lots of different areas um, and there are lots of changes that we that have happened as a result of that one of them um, the first project that we did there were in that organization in that team there were 42 improvements made to a service which was considered to be the best in the hospital so we found out you understand you see completely different things by utilizing this approach it isn't and you know in in it's not like normal data gathering really um, we've we worked with an organization in terms of streamlining streamlining a service in in a hospital and across a hospital and community services so ensuring that actually that we didn't need to um, commission a new service it was actually let's try and coordinate the service that's currently there and so that was really you know they, they were getting a lot of complaints from that particular service and it was causing a lot of problems for the people who were delivering the service and for the commissioners of the service because we're um, were split between um, commissioners and providers um, here in the UK and it was and it was causing a lot of anxiety you know at, at various levels and actually when we did this work about understanding it from the patient perspective it wasn't about developing a new service it was actually about coordinating the services that were already there and and, and developing um, and a single point of access and there were also things like um, understanding um, self-referral systems once people had diagnosis. So there are lots of differences that have been made um, through using um, experience-based design. So I'm just going to quickly take you through the four phases. Within experience-based design, the first element is about capturing. So, and we would use a narrative approach. So it's very much about capturing stories um, and then using observations. And to capture those stories, they can be done in multiple ways. So it might be that you do in-depth interviews so unstructured interviews it might be that you get people to people might want to do photo diaries so this gentleman um, had had um, some um, throat surgery and had a tracheostomy and um, when he came back in and he brought in a photo diary so he took photographs and the, t the staff knew he was a farmer but they didn't realize how involved he was still in the farm so when they he brought these photographs back and he was going to farm sales he was still doing some combining and all of uh, staff hadn't realized how active he still was at home and they were quite um, horrified really because they couldn't understand the challenges he would have to keep his tracheostomy clean when he was in a dusty environment so they learned a lot more about this person's um, life by doing this as well but it also made them think differently then about actually you know when people are when patients are with us we see them as patients because they're in that clinical room that you know they're in the waiting room they're in their bed or whatever but actually you know when people go home they live very different lives and that was a real eye-opener for um, for the staff 
The other element of capturing the stories is very much about observation and IDEO, who are a um, well-known design agency, I, I don't need to tell you, most of you that I'm sure, but when they were working with us when we were first developing our approach to, um, to innovation, and, and one of the things that they said was, you know, observation is key. Um, so, you know, it's important to understand what's happening from that experience, from the stories, but actually observation is really important because people don't always do what they say they do. People do, don't do what they think they do, and they don't always do what you think they do. So quite often, you know, we can have perception about what we think somebody does, but actually until we observe it, until we see what actually happens, then we can only really then start to find out what people really do and actually what they might need. Um, and we've, do, you know, we did some work with um, some portering services in, a, in acute hospitals. So, you know, the people who are taking patients from the wards to the, um, to radiography, taking them to physiotherapy, wherever they needed to go. And it was really interesting because we talked to people all across the board. So whether they were managers, porters, nurses, radiographers, we talked to lots of different people. And they all told us what they thought was wrong with the portering service. So they all told us what they thought needed to do. Um, one of the important things is once you've got the, um, when you've gathered and, and captured that, those stories and the observation is, you know, really is then how do we, um, how do we understand that? So it's really about developing those insights. And, um, and Henry Ford, um, I mean, he, he said that, you know, if he'd listened to his customers, he'd have built a faster horse. But what he needed to do was listen to the insights behind their needs. So it's actually understanding their experience and trying to identify um, from them their needs. So um, my screen isn't working. I'll just. So I'll carry on talking anyway. So um, I can't get up the presentation at the moment. So. Blue slide is mapping. Okay. So yep. all right. So you've moved on and I haven't then. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so um, it's um, so the next phase is really about understanding. So how do we um, map the journey? And what we would do tend to use is an emotional mapping approach. So that's about um, identifying how people feel um, along the journey um, and and using um, the concept of touch points. So it's about those moments of engagement. Um, with the service so they can be any number of things and not necessarily the traditional process things that we tend to think of um, within um, healthcare services so those moments of engagement can be finding um, the car parking space they can be that engagement with the letter you know when you get an appointment letter that the engagement with that letter which is at completely outside of the health service in terms of what you know being in the health service, but actually that interaction with that letter can have a major impact um, on, on the way you um, feel about the service and the way you experience the service, because sometimes it might not have the right information, it might not be the, the information you need. And we generally find whenever we're doing um, experience-based design programs and projects, there is generally something about communication and information. There are usually big areas that need some work doing on them. So. Um, the emotional mapping um, we tend to utilise um, as a code as part of the co-design process. So we will we will start to pull together those stories and those observation and identify the highs and lows and those emotions, those clusters of emotions, which are you know those touch points that then we can identify as areas that that we can then develop and improve. And we will do that. <coughs> With, um, with the patients and families and carers as well as the staff. So really pulling that together. And quite often we might do it indiv individually to start with, but then we would um, we might do it with staff group and patient group, but then we will always spend time um, working together. So, and then the next phase is really about improvement. So how do we then improve? So we've identified those areas, we've prioritized again together. So it's actually about ensuring that the priorities are, are identified um, with the patients and families and staff as well. Um, and then and decided what areas we want to specifically look at. And what we tend to find is that actually utilizing creative techniques. So using some of the, you know, um, creative problem solving approaches and idea generation once you've identified the area that you want to work on work really well because they're real levelers and it means that the, the hierarchy can be um, 
um, well, it can be leveled out, you know, it's a level playing field. So that really helps. Um, and it can, and just, you know, getting people to think differently because you have different people in the room. So you're more likely to get um, a breadth of um, a breadth of ideas and, and opportunities to take forward and also recognizing you know the skills that you have in the room so quite often patients and families will offer to actually yeah we can do that you know we can we can get involved in that and in particular one area we were doing some work um, and a co-design team was working looking at patient information and this and there were so the patients and staff around the table and the staff said okay we will take this information leafly and we'll rewrite it and the patient said no actually we'll take it we'll rewrite it from our perspective and then you can add your bits in afterwards so it was just turning things around rather than it being the, pa the staff writing it and then asking the patients to check it afterwards it was like the patients know what this service is like they've been through it and actually lets us do it from our perspective and then we can add in um, the clinical bits later because we know what's important to us and then you know one of the, the next bits is that is actually how do we develop those ideas you know so it's actually selecting those ideas when you've got lots of ideas how do you then you know you select them based on criteria being really clear about what those criteria are um, how you know do you want something about quick wins do you want something that doesn't cost anything thinking about what your criteria are do you want something that's specifically about safety because you might be doing something because there's an issue about safety in that particular area um, so deciding how you select the ideas is really important and then it's about once you've selected how you then build and refine and, and get into that testing um, cycle and as I mentioned earlier you know for us I think one of the big important things that we've really learned the the value of is that of prototyping you know prototyping helps you to to test the boundaries helps you to understand people's interactions with the product with the service um, and that means from the staff perspective as well as um, from the patient's perspective perspective and the other big learning for me really was about actually you know with prototyping prototype it only needs to be as good as it needs to be and I know that may sound really obvious but actually it doesn't need to be anything fancy it can literally be a piece of paper with you know the information written on it and you know and then people are much more likely to <coughs> to scribble on it, tear it up and say, actually, it needs to be this size or whatever. So just remembering that, with that within prototyping, and that's been really valuable for us about ensuring that we do that prototyping in, in to build those ideas into something that will make a difference. And we've definitely designed different things as a result of um, as, as the prototyping from the initial ideas. So, and the final section really is about, you know, within anything, um, and we put this at the end, but actually it needs to be made aware from the start, is that of measurement. You know, we need to know what differences we've made, what differences have happened as a result of, a, a result of um, the work that you've done. And within um, measurement, so you need to know what you're doing and how you're doing to start with to then be able to know that the difference that you've made. And then these are just a couple of quotes. Um, really about you know sometimes some of the measurement around experience isn't always easy but you know um, and one of the things that Paul Levy who was a chief executive in the state said that to emphasize um, that the cases involve an actual human being so every time we describe them as a percentage then we dehumanize that's the physical impact that that has on a real person and you know and I think quite often we talk about you know percentages and we talk about how many you know how many patients we see and and all of those things and actually sometimes we forget we forget I think when we have numbers that we forget that these are, are real people and actually what experience-based design allows you to do is really understand it from that human aspect and and from the emotional emotional aspect and so finally this is just um, Charles Darwin you know said that it's not the strongest of the species that survives not the most intelligent but the most responsive to change and one of the things that this approach really helps to do is actually build together because you're building together that understanding from the patients families carers and staff perspective that actually you get um, much better ownership for the change and, and in the change so um, that's it thank you very much for listening and um, I apologize for drop Paul through so uh, thank you very much Helen for that and uh, we now have plenty of room still for questions we have a microphone that can be handed around the room and we already have some um, 
Twitter um, comments uh, from the web. Um, I could uh, just start by as asking, um, you mentioned this, uh, you mentioned transformation, you mentioned frontline movements, uh, you mentioned this like a big national movement perhaps, but also things happening on a smaller scale. Is this a top-down or a bot bottom-up movement, would you say? So um, it's really it's quite interesting because within the NHS generally there's a real drive about patient experience and um, and and patient experience being very high on on the agenda. Um, it's one of the three quality domains um, for the for the NHS. I think uh, so. There is a you know there is that that top down drive. Um, but actually the people who get this are the people on the front line. The people who understand that this can really make a difference and how it can make a difference are those on the front line. And actually um, where it works best is where the front line just do it. So the people, the, you know, the nurses, the therapists, the receptionists, the ward clerks, they just, when they just take on and utilize this approach, um, and quite often what happens is that they, they will be involved in that and then they will, um, they will tell their stories then to the managers and then it sort of, it does, it tends to probably work best from the bottom up, but you know, it's a bit of both, but generally it's a, it works well bottom up because it's about understanding those people who are delivering, it's about understanding their experiences and it's very engaging that way. We have a question from Maria over Twitter who uh, is uh, asking a bit about the transfer of these changes from local setting to local setting and perhaps also connecting to this. In Sweden we have this improvement knowledge movement and also you mentioned lean, uh, which is also something uh, which is really top of mind here. How would you describe what you're talking about in, in those two uh, respects, moving from local settings and also probably connected to the improvement work that is already out there. Yeah, so I think in terms of the um, local context is, is always a challenge. So um, yeah, I mean, Maria's written, not invented here, often gets in the way and it, and it still does. I mean, I think the important thing about the EBD is that the, because it's about understanding the experience for those patients and those staff and that service that actually there has to be that element of understanding from that, from that perspective and um, so the context is important so and often those ideas from other places some of them might get taken up but in reality it, it is it, the context is really important and so using getting still doing that observation you might think actually this might work here you know, we might transfer these this learning from one idea, one place to another, but actually you might want to use that as part of your testing and a part of your getting your experiences from people and then that will help as an engagement. So absolutely, we still have that problem with the not invented here. We also, the difficulty I think as well that we're, um, we want to do much more work on and research on is how do we get spread of this approach um, across organisations? You know, as I said, we have you know, 3 million patients a week, we have, you know, 1.4 million staff, actually, how do we get the utilizing this approach? So one team might use it within an organization, but actually then it often doesn't spread within that organization, even let alone across um, to other organizations. So, and that's one of our big areas. So it does tend to be, we we're talking before about the bottom up thing, it does tend to be you get individual um, people champions who are really keen and will take it forward so you know we're trying to do we're doing quite a lot more work and research on that at the moment about how do we get that spread either across an organization that this is their approach that they will utilize um, or from one organization to another so I hope that answers your question Maria and in terms of the lean work um, within the NHS Institute we developed a um, productive series which was um, so productive which is also called releasing time to care some of you may have heard of that um, and that's very much about using it uses the lean methodology and we developed a um, specific um, product for productive wards for productive community services productive leader mental health ward and um, productive general practice um, surgeries and so we've um, and within that what was really interesting when we were the initial productive ward and the initial um, 
AEBD work that we were doing were sort of developed alongside each other. And interestingly, as we were working with organizations, the people who'd done productive ward were just like, this fits because it, it's the next step. So actually the productive ward was doing the lean process and understanding that and identifying a lot of the inefficiencies. But what they felt that this added to was um, because it really helps to understand the value from the experience of the patients and the families and from the staff. So it's really, it helps you to understand value from a slightly different perspective to um, tr traditional lean. But actually, a lot of people have found it really valuable to, to work those in tandem. And um, Bolton, who um, you may have heard of, they have their um, Bolton Improving Care um, system, which is, you know, they were one of the first organisations um, over here to become, to use lean as their key um, approach they also they use EBD alongside that and help and they build on each other's work so yeah they they definitely work together so thank you we have a question from the audience but b before that just we have a comment there for uh, in what ways does experience-based design complement and challenge lean and that's a bit what what you're saying they can work hand in hand is that uh, yeah 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 oh. yeah um, and you know it does challenge. Um, it does challenge because it's about the it's about understanding the value, um, and 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 un doing using patient experience and and staff experience, um, often might come up with slightly different um, definitions of value and what's important to people because you're thinking about the experience, not just the process. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience. Well, hello. My name is Jürgen Nordström. I'm from Karolinska. Uh, uh, the fourth point was uh, measurement, uh, but you didn't give any data on that. Uh, I would be interested to hear what sort of measurement, if it's measuring the process or measuring outcome, and um, what, uh, what, uh, what are your uh, experience so far that it improves uh, health and, uh, and uh, yeah. for the true outcome measures would be, of course, most interesting. Yeah, so um, in terms of the measurement work, um, most of the measurement we talk about measuring the improvement. So we're, so we're measuring the changes that have been made. So it might be that we, you know, you measure the specifics around process because that's still, that will, those still change as part of using EBD. It isn't, you don't ignore process because it's about, because it's about patient experience. There is still those elements. So we still, you will still measure things about process um, and also the safety. So there are all those sorts of measures that will still be utilized. Um, and, but so it's very much about how we measure that improvement. Um, and every project is different because every project identifies different things to work on so it's it's about being clear about when you when you're identifying the areas that you're going to improve is being clear about what those measures are in relation to that um, and and I think and the other element is that is that of experience you know we know that measurement of experience isn't easy there's a lot of work being done within um, the NHS around patient experience surveys and and they measure experience to a point but you know I wouldn't necessarily guarantee that using an EBD approach might increase that. Um, you would hope it would increase that experience survey, um, but you, but it might not. So um, we, because sometimes what it does is helps to open up some of the other challenges and some of the other issues. So measurement is really very much about the measure, the measurement of change that you make, and so it depends on the project that you're working on. We have a, a comment here on Twitter from Torbjorn Heglov. He says, do you have any views on healthcare innovation in relation to reimbursement systems? And perhaps there is some connection here with measurement. Sorry, I missed that. I, I just lost you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, we have a question on Twitter. If you have any views on healthcare innovation in relation to reimbursement systems. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good, a good yeah. question. <laughs> um, I, I think I think it. One of the challenges we've had is actually we've found that it, there's often um, negative um, incentives to innovation in in some areas. So um, it's it's a challenge, and I, I I don't know. I think each each case is different, but actually I often find um, we've often found because of the payment systems are are, are often counterintuitive um, to to innovation. So. Um, and, and what we, we did some work specifically looking at um, ambulatory emergency care and worked with the Department of Health trying to ensure that the tariff that 
people were getting for not admitting people was um, was was supportive of having an innovative approach to dealing with um, some of the emergency care um, admissions or or not or trying to manage them in an ambulatory way. So we've we've done we've done some work on trying to work with departments of health to to try and manage some of that. So um, that's that's probably as far as my views go, really. But yes, I think it's it's hard one. We have a question from the audience here. Yes, my, my name is Hans Malmqvist. I'm from a research institute, Swedish ICT. Uh, I have a question about, uh, you have your co-design group here, but how do you transfer their information over to the ICT people? Uh, do they develop functional specifications or technical specifications? This is a very critical point. Yeah, we would we would try and involve we would try and ensure that the ICT people were involved in those co-design groups. Um, so if we if we, there was something that was specifically about um, technology, then we would try and ensure that they were involved um, in the project as well, because it's really important to have the right people all the way through. Um, and so it isn't just about bringing people in at the end and saying, right, we want this doing, go and develop it. It's actually about how can we ensure? Because I think then if the if if the ICT people have been involved throughout, then they understand what the needs are as well from people, so that then that can, we can ensure that it's the right um, specification. But there's a risk there that they will push on uh, the current solution they already have. So if you have a new proposal, <laughs> they're they a bit reluctant to that. Yeah, and I, you know, and that's about the engagement. One of the big things we find with, you know, and it's not just within ICT, but within um, lots of clinic clinicians and, and, and certain groups who like to work in certain ways, like to use certain approaches. But actually, you know, once you involve patient stories, once they start to hear what it's like for patients, and, you know, understand that's what we're here for, then actually then they start to think differently and it actually helps with that engagement in terms of, the change and and approach to change rather than just actually we're okay with what we've got so we do find that having that having the stories and having the observation of what actually happens and understanding it from the user perspective um, it does make a big difference actually so getting that engagement from that early early stage is really important so it is always a risk I, I can't I, I can't get rid of that risk altogether for you I'm sorry <laughs> but but it does help this approach do you have any experience of, of really structured ways to involve the, the users, the patients, the families? Um, so, um, in terms of, so it, it depends a lot on, on, the, on the engagement within the service. So, um, and we don't really have particularly structured ways. What we, tend to, um, what we tend to do is have an approach to engaging people. So, thinking about, so, you know, who are the right patients? Who are the right service users? Do we want to um, focus in on extreme users? So, for example, or particular um, demographic groups. So, for example, um, some uh, there was a, an organisation in London who were having a, um, a real challenge around maternity health, and in particular, um, a Chinese population. Um, and that that particular um, organisation had quite a high um, high percentage of, of Chinese ladies, and they were having they were having a lot of um, maternal health issues um, and babies more stillbirths than in any other group and so what they did was they utilized this approach to understand what it what was the problem within within this particular group of of, of people so they focused in on that particular area um, and and it was a and basically it was about the fact that um, their cult in their culture you don't go to hospital so they never they weren't going to antenatal clinics they weren't going because you don't need to because you know hospital is for ill people and um, so they weren't use, utilizing the maternity services. We've also done some work specifically with, um, with um, sickle cell anemia um, sufferers in, um, in another organization in London and again it's just about identifying, so if you're identifying a very specific group, there were a particular age group who were um, having a problem with not attending for services or, or causing trouble at, at certain points in the service, so they focused in on that area, on that group of people and, and, and then, it, so it was then it's just about how you identify the groups that you want to you want to work with and then about the engagement materials so about ensuring that you have 
you know, information leaflets that are in the right languages, that are easy to read, that if you don't, if your client group don't read particularly well or, or you know, or aren't particularly literate, then actually how do we engage? So it's then again about how do we engage from the staff perspective so staff can, um, can help to identify people. So not a really structured approach, um, but just being really clear about what groups that you might want to utilize um, and want to approach. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. Hello, my name is Henrik Allen. Uh, I always wondered why experience-based design is not used much more in the healthcare sector, in all kinds of development projects. So I wonder, in your experience, what is the resistance you meet when you try to implement these methods in your projects? Mm, so do I. <laughs> um, I, the, I we, we, we're still trying to wrestle with that question, actually. Um, it's amazing because when people do it and they and they they get so such good results and they share their stories and they're so enthusiastic what often happens is they're often individuals are champions within a team um, and then what doesn't happen is that that capability isn't built within the organization to then translate it into other settings or other teams or other um, departments um, and that seems to have been the main thing um, I also think that there's a big um, there's a big challenge around, you know, we, I talked earlier on about the fact that we have to stop before we start, that we have to truly understand what the issues are. And because in the NHS people feel pressured with time, the, the time to do the upfront stories and observation is, I think, is often the barrier. So people say we haven't got the time to do that. Those who make the time to do it see the value, but actually quite often people are feeling under pressure because of the process and the... Um, and the safety aspects and they think they've just got to deal with that and then and, and we've just got to move on and if somebody's got an idea to solve the problem let's just go with that rather than really try and understand what the problem is so I, I think it's the time commitment that people are anxious about quite often so uh, how there is some some kind of knowledge that needs to be infused in the frontline teams and is it, how do you do that is it consultants you send or is it um, uh, it, it's variable, so um, I, I don't know. We, we, we haven't got it right because it's not utilised enough, I don't think, across the NHS. Um, so I think, I think the big thing is getting the good stories, so almost being a bit sort of actually getting some of the stories, some of the patient stories, and then and engaging with the right people to be able to do that. And it is about, you know, service managers um, be saying, actually, yes, it's okay, you do have some time, to go and do those stories and and to understand and to de and to develop the insights from that, because that's that's the challenge. People don't um, don't recognise the value of that time yet. So I think we've got quite a long way to go in terms of you know when you've got a champion for it, it's fine. But actually, in in general, um, I think that it's that recognising the time up front and and how valuable that will be and what difference it will make. So I think that's the bit that we need to get better at. Has there been any specific sources of funding for for service providers that want to engage in this kind of activities? So, no, not specifically. So, some organizations, they might identify it as part of their patient experience strategy. So, they might say, well, actually, it's part of our patient experience and we have a budget for that. We want to utilize um, experience-based design in so many projects. And some people, some organizations have done that. Um, some organizations... Um, have, have just, you know, they have a service improvement budget, so they might allocate it as some of that. But it's, it's very um, hit and miss, really, and, and variable between those organizations. We have a question from the online audience here. Uh, Anne Fatten, a lot of interesting thoughts and methods. What about cases, examples, and results of good design? Have you gathered these together? Where, where can we find them? Yeah, so we have some. Um, there are some on the um, in the co we have a concepts and case studies book, um, which I think some of you may may have access to. Um, so there are some of those, um, and at the moment, then they're not freely. The, some of them are not freely available. Some of them are up on the website. Um, 
Um, but the Concepts and Case Studies book has some of our, our success stories and we're actually in the process of trying to build some more and also think about how we continue to share these in the future because as um, I didn't mention in my um, presentation but the NHS Institute as it is is closing at the end of March so we're trying to work out how we can ensure that some of those will be more available um, but yeah it's just through the Concepts and Case Studies book at the moment. Do we have any more questions from, from the audience? Um, I think I, I would just like to ask you for one final thing. What, what's your favorite example from these wor years working in, in this field? What's, your, what's the, the story you love the most? <laughs> oh, I can tell stories all day. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there are, there, are just, um, there are just so many. But one of the stories was when we were, doing, we were working with um, a group of patients with who had multiple sclerosis and so there were a lot of challenges around that service there were a lot of complaints around the service um, the um, acute hospital provider was really clear, you know they were really specific about what they wanted they wanted to provide a community neurology service so there were a lot of challenges around when we were first setting up this service the um, local MS society and um, the charity were were pushing against um, the service because they were saying it's a really bad service we've got you know a lot of problems with that service and we we did some work with them we interviewed in-depth interview with patients we shadowed staff and interviewed interviewed staff and the big thing that came out of the whole stories and the, all of the stories was actually what the problem was they didn't need a new service what they needed was coordination of the current service and link better linkages between health and social care and so there were all sorts of um, different things that we did and we um, and two years after we'd done the project and after it had all been implemented we did a video um, about the about the about the um, the whole project and what was great on that was that there were two of the patients who who would really um, put a lot of challenge into the service and they made a lot of complaints and they talked about how valuable the service was now and how two years on they don't have to worry about their healthcare now because actually they know that when they ring up they'll be able to see someone so it was just amazing and then t last year we were I was presenting um, that video I showed that video and presenting about experience-based design um, at an event over in Wales and at the end of the session somebody um, stood up and said oh I'm a clinician in in um, in Ealing which was where this was and my heart sunk because I thought he was going to say and it's a dreadful service you know it's not working anymore and he stood there and he said you know he said I work in that in in Ealing and he said and that service is the best service we have in our whole um, in any service that we can access it's just a great service and for me that was great because I was like I was a bit worried that I was not going to be able to use it as a story anymore but you know the fact that four years on that service is still working really well the challenge for me is the fact that it hasn't translated into other services within the organization so because the team who did the work work in that service and they've not then been released or you know um, probably because they need to do their clinical role but they've not then been released or transferred that into other parts of the of that organization so that's you know but uh, you know the fact that you hear from somebody else that it's been a real success story is, was great for me so yeah I, I just love it when you know people can continue to get a good service Thank you very much, Helen, for, for being with us or uh, letting us be with you today. Thank you. And um, uh, so thank you all. And uh, our next webinar is the 20th of February, uh, and it will be on the power of patient expectations uh, by um, Jason Wolf from the Barrel Institute in Washington, D.C. So he will up, be up very early that morning to be with us. Uh, so I think, uh, and uh, you can continue to follow this on Twitter with this hashtag and also we have a LinkedIn group uh, that we will send you invitations uh, to all the participants in these webinars. So I think some of you have already received an invitation to that LinkedIn group. And perhaps the video, we could post it, the link to that. Is, is it available, Helen? The um, I can, I can, the, the multiple sclerosis one, I can, yeah. I'll, yeah, I can, I'll do that. I'll yeah. see if I can upload that. That's wonderful. So that kind of information we could conti continue yeah. on, on the web. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Tack så hemskt mycket. Tack för idag. Hej, hej.